All right, good afternoon. Oh, we'll, we'll try this again. Good afternoon. All right, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna need a little bit of that uh, back and forth when we get to the homily later. Uh, welcome to the Lessons and Carols service this Christmas Eve. Uh, Lessons and Carols is a format that developed, I think it was first done in 1880 on Christmas Eve in some church in Britain and it's nine lessons or nine scripture lessons, nine readings from the Bible and nine what they call carols. Uh, this is based on that format. Uh, if you were to go to the Wikipedia page and read the songs that they have for some of these carols, I don't know that we know them and I don't know that we could pull them off if we had the music. And so we've adjusted, uh, we've adjusted some of the songs and we've adjusted the final reading. But uh, this is a, a service that progresses through the, what we might call the history of redemption leading up to the birth of Jesus. Um, it talks about the Old Testament anticipation of Jesus. And so uh, we'll go through these nine lessons and carols. Uh, after every lesson, there's a hymn to the side there and it's got the hymnal number. So you'll need one of these sheets, you'll need a hymnal. And then when we are finished with all the lessons, then the choir will have a, an anthem for us, and then we'll go to our candle lighting. In the candle lighting, we're gonna sing Silent Night, and rather than try to hold the candle and the sheet of paper and the hymnal and something in your teeth and all that, the words that we're gonna sing for the candle lighting are on the back side of this sheet, okay? Uh, for the candle dripping portion of, this, of the service this evening. And that's actually why uh, one of our Advent candles has burned out so much and dripped out on the side that uh, it's not lit, but we'll just say that we tried to light it. Uh, we, after the homily and the choir, um, we will begin the uh, candlelight portion of the service. I will go over and take a light from the Christ candle and the, uh, the, the rule yeah, you're going to get some rules on Christmas Eve. The rule is if you have a hot candle, it always stays up and down. So if you have a not hot candle, you're the one that gets to tip it. Because if you have a hot candle and it's been hot for very long and you tip it, guess what this turns into? A candle dripping service, right? All right. So uh, just a reminder. So uh, whoever's got the, the flame, always keep it upright. And when you pass it, you share it with somebody, and they will tip their candle to take the flame. All right? Are we good on how the service is going to work this afternoon? All right. Uh, welcome. Again, uh, let me find my list here. As we've made our Advent journey to the manger, we found ourselves hearing the promises that the Lord made to his people as they waited for a delivered prom promised long ago. On the first Sunday of Advent, we waited in hope as we lit the candle of promise and we heard from the prophet Jeremiah. On the second Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of preparation as we heard about the messenger sent to prepare the way as told in the prophet Malachi. On the third Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of praise as we sang aloud, exalted, and rejoiced in a Lord who also sings over us as the prophet Zephaniah told us. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of peace in anticipation of the presence of the Lord as told by the prophet Micah. And on this Christmas Eve, we have lit the Christ candle, symbolizing Jesus Christ, the light of the world, coming into the world. So with that in mind, oh, come, let us adore him. Punishment for their rebellion, and that the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head in Genesis 3, verses 8 through 19. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid 
because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me, the, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth your children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so from that point on, uh, every Jewish woman who knew that promise would wonder if her son was to be that promised one that would come and crush the serpent's head. And uh, when I first heard this version of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, it really resonated with me because I think this version taps into uh, the longing of God's people through the years. Our typical hymnal one is kind of sweet and lilting. Uh, this one, I almost imagine that it's being sung uh, maybe by a, a woman giving birth in a semi in a diesel truck stop somewhere in Iowa in the dark cold. I think this captures a little bit of that longing uh, in a different way. Let us 
God promises to Abraham that by his descendants all the nations of the earth will obtain blessings in Genesis 22 verses 15 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Isaiah announces the birth of a king to a people in darkness in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 to 7. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a slight shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
We hear that the king is coming and will usher in reign of the justice for the poor and peace for all of God's creation. From Micah 5, verses 2 to 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, and one who is to be ruler in Israel, who is coming forth is old from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. The angel Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary that she will give birth to God's promised son, whose kingdom will never end, as reported in Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. <laughs> and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The sixth lesson, against the backdrop of emperors and taxes, Jesus is born, as Luke reports in chapter 2, verses 1 to 7 in the Gospel. Luke 2. In those days, a decree went out to Caesarea Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up to the, from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is, he called uh, Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her give, to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn.
seventh lesson. The shepherds go to see the Savior of the world and find him laying in a manger in Luke. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. And in the same region, region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which it, the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. lesson. The wise men followed the star to find the child Jesus, the king of the Jews, as Matthew tells us in Matthew 2, 1 through 11. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, 
for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him, him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. ninth lesson. Now, the birth of Jesus took place this way as Matthew tells us. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. 
But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Thank you, choir. You may be seated. And so at long last, this Advent, we find ourselves almost ready to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus. If you've been traveling with us on Sundays uh, toward the manger, we've heard a lot about John the Baptist because Advent is a season of preparation. And I'm going to try to put us off for about seven more hours. And then we will celebrate so we are almost, the preparations are almost complete. Uh, and we'll actually uh, do the ninth reading tomorrow in the service. So that's actually the sermon text for tomorrow. So I swapped it out. In this last reading for this evening in Matthew, he tells us of this sticky situation that Joseph and Mary found themselves in before Jesus was born. Now, again, if you've been with us this Advent, uh, we heard a lot about John the Baptist, which is, might be unusual or foreign to you during a Christmas time. But what we have here with Mary and Joseph might be a little too familiar to us. We've heard this part before. And indeed, this is just a rehearsal of the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We find Mary and Joseph in a sticky situation in our passage, but then the Lord gets involved. See, because there are times when you have to be involved personally. Because if you want to get something done right, you have to do it. Oh, see, I, 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 we're going to have to try that again. If you want to have something done right, you have to do it yourself. Do it yourself. Let's try that again. If you want to get something done right, you have to do it yourself. Now that's more like it. How did the Lord get involved in our passage? The Lord himself names Jesus. If you want something done right, you have to... Do it yourself. Right there in verse 21, God sent an angel to deliver the name that Joseph should give Jesus. But this isn't actually the only name that the Lord chose for Jesus. As a matter of fact, there's another name in our passage, Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, if you were to read the rest of the scriptures... The Bible gives Jesus a lot of titles, a lot. Uh, advocate, Almighty, the Amen, the Apostle of our profession, the Author of Salvation, the Blessed and Only Ruler, the Bread of God, the Bread of Life, the Chief Cornerstone, the Chief Shepherd, the Creator, the Deliverer, First and the Last, the Faithful Witness, the Faithful and True, the Great, the gate, the great shepherd, the great high priest, the head of the church, the hope of glory, the horn of salvation, the king eternal, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish, the last Adam, the light of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the living stone, the man from heaven. The, do I need to go on and on? This, I've got two pages full of these. And so the Lord gets involved and picks the name for Jesus. Because one single name cannot contain all his excellencies. One single name is not enough. And so long before this time with Joseph, God sent word to his people through the prophet Isaiah about this other name, Emmanuel. So the Lord himself picked not just these two names, but also throughout the rest of the Bible, picked a number of names for Jesus. Because a single name can't contain all the excellencies. If you want something done right, sometimes you just have to, and the Lord himself picked the names for Jesus. Now, the Lord also stepped into Joseph's plans for his relationship with Mary in our passage. Joseph was going to divorce Mary. 
he was going to put her away quietly. They'd been betrothed. Now, we don't talk about betrothed in our day. We do talk, sometimes talk about being engaged. We might say they were engaged, except betrothal in their day was like marriage in every way except one. They had not consummated the marriage, and it was legally binding. If you get engaged today, it's not legally binding. In Mary and Joseph's day, if you were in betrothed, that was as legally binding as marriage is. And it, would so, it was so legally binding that it would take a formal divorce to separate the relationship. And this is something that Joseph could have done, or he thought he could have done, uh, a formal divorce to break it. And it appeared that he wasn't interested in tweeting about it or making a TikTok about it or making sure the bad news got somehow leaked to the major news outlets. He resolved to do this with as little public fuss as, poly as possible. And this is admirable for sure. And we see in our passage that Joseph did what God told him to. He took Mary as his wife. And when Jesus was born, he gave him the name Jesus. So we do see Joseph's obedience highlighted in this passage, which is something that would make us wonder about our obedience when God tells us things. But it's here that Joseph's obedience, as wonderful as it was, it would not take care of Joseph's main problem. No matter what kind of husband or earthly father Joseph would wind up being, he still had a problem that only the Lord can fix. He was still born a sinner. And no matter how hard you try, you can't save yourself. You can't do it yourself. See, the angel appeared to Joseph in the dream and told Joseph this, She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, if we were ever going to be saved from our sins, it must be God himself who would do it. No amount of obedience we could muster as right obedience to the Lord is. No amount of obedience could ever save us. We need a Savior, and we can't be our own Savior. So sometimes, if you want something done right, you have to. Do it and so God himself, in the very person of Jesus, would come to save us from our sins. And that's why we call Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. He took on flesh to be near to us so that one day he might offer himself up on the cross as your high priest. That's something you could not do for yourself. If you want something done right, you have to And so we can't ever afford to separate the coming of the Lord Jesus at his birth with the purpose of his taking on flesh like ours, to give himself on the cross to save his people from their sins. You see, Christmas is a massively big deal because the Son of God took on flesh and got involved in our mess, came to our world to fix our problems that we made, but he does not do that apart from going to the cross. So Christmas is a big deal, not just because some little baby was born. Babies are born all the time. Christmas is a big deal because one very special baby was born who would one day give himself on the cross to save his people from their sins. And even though Joseph's obedience to the Lord is highlighted in our passage, Jesus would need to be a spotless, sinless lamb to be the sacrifice for our sins. You see, Joseph, although obedient in our passage, was not sinless. But because the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb without Joseph, Jesus could be born as your spotless lamb. And this would not have happened if the Lord had not stepped in. You see, when you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. And the Lord saw to it that Joseph would be a father to Jesus, but not a biological father to Jesus. Not having Joseph's sinful nature passed on, Jesus would be the spotless, sinless lamb for you. He's going to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And that's what happened. God himself came to live amongst us to be God's very presence with us, to be our Emmanuel, 
God with us so that he might save us from our sins. Sometimes when you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. And the Lord has done that for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord wanted to save you, he sent his very own son. He did it himself because we cannot. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like there's hope for Lake County. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is absolutely good news for you right here and right now. Uh, it is my desire that everybody who hears my voice tonight, if you have not trusted the Lord Jesus to save you from your sins, if you have not uh, bowed the knee to him, that you would do that this very evening. So hear it, believe it, repent, and live. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you uh, that you saw fit, that when it was time, in the fullness of time, you sent the Lord Jesus to be born of the virgin, to be born under the law, to save us from the curse of the law. So, Father, uh, we thank you that you did it yourself. And uh, we ask that as we prepare to celebrate his birth tomorrow, that you would continue to lead us and guide us. And we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen and amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, the true light, was coming into the world. And uh, for all those who have trusted in him, uh, they were given the right to be born again. Born not of man or a woman or the will of a man, but born of God. And if you hold this light and you trust in Jesus, then you are the one to bear his light to a darkened world. So with that in mind, let us pray as we close the service this evening. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, that he came into a darkened world, and that he was the true light. And so, Father, we ask that as you work in us, that we would bear him to our friends and our relatives and our co-workers, and yes, Lord, even to our enemies, so that the world may know the Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who saved his people from their sins. So, Father, let us be witnesses for him in a dark world. We thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray these things. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. And we will see you in the morning. The Feast of the Nativity is on.